Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you whenever and wherever you're watching from right now. My name is Pastor Grant and this is online worship with First Christian Church in Sullivan, Illinois. I speak for all of our church family when I say that thank you for joining us, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time. We welcome you also to join us anytime in person for worship on Sundays at 10 a.m. Our online gathering here will give you a window into who we are, but you can also check out our website at www.sullivan.church. Now let's quiet our hearts and minds as we enter into a time of worship. Let's pray. God, I thank you for each person participating in online worship right now. I ask that you guide our time together. Please speak to us through your Holy Spirit. May all who join this, join us, be encouraged, inspired, and blessed. Amen. We now have a short uh, video that serves as our call to worship, and then you're welcome to join in singing a song of praise. And 
brought us all salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And everywhere go, tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. It is important that we take some time during worship to lift others in prayer to God. And that, that may mean praying for specific people or situations or circumstances. During in-person worship on Sundays, we share these things aloud, but online we keep them private for the sake of privacy. However, if you have a specific request or concern, you can share that aloud where you are right now, or you can send it along to me via email, grant at FCCSullivan.org. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so fortunate to be gathered by you to hear the good news. We celebrate that we are a community of people, each at different point on our faith journeys, each seeking your healing love and mercy. We are called to witness to the good news of Jesus who taught us about your love for each one of us and for your magnificent creation. But there are those for whom this word seems a distant hope or experience. They struggle with the difficulties of everyday living, with addictions or illnesses or alienation. So help us to bring the good news to them in gentle kindness and compassionate understanding. Let our actions and attitudes reflect all that Jesus taught. For just a moment, we take a breath and we remember those that we love who are in difficult experiences right now as we pray silently. Lord, you hear the cries of your people. And so we ask for your healing mercies on all whom we lift before you now. We also ask for your healing in our own lives. Keep our hearts open to your love. Help us to be witnesses of your mercy and hope wherever you place us. Thank you for the grace that you have given to us through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Timothy's, uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 2. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 from the New Living Translation. May God add blessings to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this word today. Well, Happy New Year. We're going to uh, begin this year by looking at Sunday school stories that you thought you knew. These are stories we all heard growing up, but, but maybe we haven't given them much thought since then. So next week, we'll look at the story of Adam and Eve. That's the story of how we all came to be, right? However, but before we get to this new series, I, I thought it would be helpful, maybe a good idea for us to start off the year asking ourselves the question, why study, study the Bible at all? You've probably heard or said the phrase, the, the Bible clearly says... But if the Bible is so clear, then, then what need do we have to even study it? Can't we just read the words from our Bible and understand them like we would 
some regular old book? Well, for some people, it's much easier to say, you know, this is what the Bible clearly says than to really try to dig deep and understand that for many scriptures, there is more that lies beneath the surface. So that's what we're going to talk about today and for the first several Sundays of this year. In, in fact, I want to dig a little deeper with you to see what lies underneath the surface because with most Bible stories, there's a version that we teach children and then there's the whole story. So let's begin today by asking ourselves a fundamental question. What is the Bible? Why study it? What is it? I've had several conversations over the years about exactly just what is the Bible. Uh, for some people, they would readily acknowledge that this book is a library of books and it has deeply shaped our world in countless ways and yet they may not have a clue of what it's actually about other than vague references to David and Goliath, David, David killing Goliath, other than the fact that in the book of 2 Samuel it's written that a man named Elhanan killed Goliath, or ominous warnings about the end of the world, or stories about Jesus doing things like turning water into wine, really? That's his first miracle? He makes it possible for people to keep drinking for days on end? Maybe this is why Jesus was accused of being a drunk? I don't know. Uh, for others, they've heard someone quote the Bible, and something about what that person said made them think to themselves, you know, there's no way it actually says that. And yet they don't have some better or more informed way to counter the explanation that they heard, other than, you can't be serious, that's crazy. And then, for others, the Bible caught them off guard. They had an experience, that they, they tasted something, they, they felt something, or they endured something, and they discovered within the Bible language for what they'd experienced. They were wronged by someone and in moments of honesty realized that they wanted that person to die in a violent and gruesome fashion, only to discover that these exact impulses described in vivid detail in the Psalms. How is it that someone writing thousands of years ago in a different place, in a different language, in a different culture could describe with such startling detail exactly what I'm feeling here now in the modern world? How could something so many have discarded as irrelevant be at some times so shockingly relevant? All of these are, are good questions. Questions we would never think to ask when we were kids in Sunday school. But first, we'll start with how the Bible came to be the Bible. Then we'll look at some of the big stories of the Bible about creation and floods and covenants and coats and fish, all in order to explore what's going on just below the surface of the stories in the Bible. Then we'll address some of the ways many people were taught to think and talk about the Bible. The Bible is God's word, the good book, the living word, it's principles for living, it's the absolute standard, the inerrant truth about which there can be no compromise. God's ultimate view on things. You've heard all those phrases. You see, many of those ways of thinking and talking about the Bible, that's fine as a child, but they're not really working like they used to for lots and lots and lots of people. All of this will hopefully then lead to understanding the Bible in your mind and in your heart in ways that are both fully engaged as you see it and read it for what it is. It's this funky, ancient, poetic, revolting, provocative, mysterious, scandalous, inspired collection of books called the Bible that, that tell a story, a story that we desperately need to hear. So first then, let's talk just a bit about how we got the Bible. Someone wrote something down. Kind of obvious, but it's true. And it's an important starting point. The Bible did not just magically drop out of the sky. The Bible was written by people, people like you and me. Again, obvious, but, but it helps ground us in how we begin thinking about what the Bible is. Because many of the stories in the Bible, they began as oral traditions, handed down from generation to generation until someone collected them, edited them, and, and actually decided to write them down some hundreds of years later. 
So that's years and years of people sitting around fires and walking along hot, dusty roads and gathering together to hear and discuss and debate and wrestle with these stories. The people who, who wrote these books, they had a lot of material to choose from. There were lots of stories floating around. There were lots of accounts being handed down, lots of material to include or not include. There's a line in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, I think it's chapter 11, where the author writes, says, As for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the book of the annals of Solomon? Well, yeah, I, I guess they are. It's just that we have no idea what the author is referring to. It's interesting. The assumption on the author's part is that not only do we know this, but that we have access to these annals which we don't. We see something similar in the Gospel of John where it's written, uh, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. And the book ends with this line, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. It's as if the writer, just to wrap things up, adds, oh, oh yeah, I, I left a ton of stuff out. Sorry. The authors of the books of the Bible, and they weren't just writing. They were selecting and editing and making a multitude of decisions about what material and content furthered their purposes in writing and what didn't. These writers, they had, they had agendas. Luke says, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. The book of Esther says, this is what happened. The book of John says, these are written that you may believe. You see, there were points they were trying to make. There were, there were things they wanted their readers to see, insights that they wanted to share. And it's important to note that these, were, these writers, they were real people. They were living in real places at real times. And their purposes and their intents and their agendas, they were shaped by their times and places and contexts and economies and politics and religion and technology and, and countless other factors, just like when we write today. So what does it tell us about the world that Abraham lived in that when he's told to offer his son as a sacrifice... He sets out to do it as if it's a natural thing for God to ask. Seems pretty strange to me. Or the David and Goliath story, it starts with technology. The Philistines have a new kind of metal that the Israelites don't. The story is framed by the fear that comes when, when your neighbor has weapons that you don't have, like spears or guns or bombs. Why does the Apostle Peter use the phrase, there is no other name under heaven? Where did he get this phrase and what images from military propaganda would, have, would it have suggested for his listeners? So we have real people writing in real places at real times with agendas, choosing to include some material, choosing to leave out other material, all because they had stories to tell. So a couple of thoughts then to kind of sum this all up. First, for some, the Bible is just a collection of old books. Books written by people, nothing more. For others, yes, the Bible is a collection of books, but it's also more than just a collection of books. They're, they're books, but they're more than just books. So it's important to begin by stating the obvious. The Bible is first, before anything else, a library of books written by humans. I say this because there is a rigid belief that, that many have encountered in regard to the Bible that makes great claims about its divinity and inspiration and perfection, but then doesn't know what to do with its humanity. Like, why do the four resurrections, resurrection accounts in the gospel differ on some of the basic details? Or why aren't there any clear denunciations of polygamy or slavery? Why does Paul say in the New Testament that it's him writing, not the Lord? You see, when people charge in with great certainty, this is what it says clearly. When they say that this is God's word, all the while neglecting the very real humanity of these books, they can inadvertently rob these writings of their sacred power, all because of starting in 
the wrong place. You start with the human, you ask those questions, you enter there, you direct your energies to understanding why these people wrote these books. Because whatever divine you find in it, you find that divine through the human, not in spite of it or around it. And second, then, just a bit about questions. Often, especially when people come to a particularly strange or gruesome or inexplicable passage, they'll ask, why did God say this? The, the problem with this question is that it leaves you tied up in all kinds of knots. Really, God told them to kill all the women and children? God did? And we're supposed to just accept that that's, well, that's how God is? It's that sort of thing. Maybe a better question is, why did people find it important to tell that story? Followed by, what was it that moved them to record these words? Followed by, what was, what was happening in the world at that time? And then asking, what does this passage or story or poem or verse tell us about how people understood who they were and who God is? And then, what's the story that's unfolding here, and why did these people think it was the story worth communicating? So that's where I want to start our year together. So how, what do you take away from a sermon like this one? Well, I, I want you to do some homework this week, just a little bit. I want you to, to spend some time reflecting about your conclusions about the Bible. What is it that you have been taught about some of the most basic stories? Can you recall some of the lessons you learned in Sunday school? And then I want you to ask yourself, what do I have questions about? Am I willing to examine that? Am I open to seeing things differently? Can I challenge myself to see the Bible from a different perspective this year? In a couple of weeks, we're going to take one of the, the big stories, the one about a flood. We're going to ask these questions. We'll ask these questions about several stories. We're going to work to understand these stories considering their context, their genre. So spend some time preparing yourself. Maybe invite somebody to join you on the journey. After all, what good is our church if we're not journeying together, dialoguing, bringing others alongside to join us in this process of growth and maturity? Let's pray. God, help us to keep our hearts and minds open. Help us to f feel comfortable and safe asking difficult or big questions. To be okay with wrestling. To, to not have all of the answers always figured out. God, as we look at some of these beautiful Bible stories over the next several weeks, I pray that you would stir within us a desire to see, to hear, to know, to learn, and to grow. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. time of offering is helpful for us to commit ourselves to God's service. In this time, we celebrate God's blessings, recognizing that God has called us to love and give and serve others as he leads us. So we thank you for your continued support of the work and ministry of FCC through your gifts that you give either online, through the mail, or when you're in person on Sundays. May you also carry forth the spirit of generosity into the world around you. Would you join me in prayer now over our offerings that are represented among us? Let's pray. God, we bring our gifts to you and offer them as a symbol of sacrifice and service. We seek to share the story of love that fulfills and conquers death. Bless these gifts that we give now and all who give. Use our offerings, our time, our abilities for the good of all your people. Amen. As we prepare now for our time of communion, I trust that you've gathered elements that you may use to participate. If not, you can pause the video right now and go grab something. It doesn't have to be the traditional bread and grape juice as we use on Sundays. 
we participate in this act of communion, remembering and celebrating Christ's victory over death. Through his sacrifice, we are promised life anew. So as you partake today, accept completely the love and forgiveness that God offers to you. All are welcome to this meal as Christ has invited us. You may consume of the elements at any point that you feel led during this next piece of music. And that brings us to the conclusion of our time together for online worship. Thank you again for joining us. I hope it was a meaningful time of worship for you. Now, as you leave this place, go forth in peace and hope, for God is your guardian and guide. Bring news of God's good love to all that you meet. Amen.